Hey, I'm Pratik Chavla, a founding engineer with Monte Carlo. I'm a huge fan of Airflow and use the tool a lot, not just as a key integration for Monte Carlo, but also as an engineer myself, from orchestrating workloads to circuit breaking data pipelines to prevent data downtime, which is the topic we'll be discussing today. Let's briefly go over our agenda. First, we're going to discuss what data downtime even is and why it's a critical problem data engineers need to consider when building and scaling their systems. Then we'll talk about the primary ways teams solve via a data reliability workflow. After that, we'll talk about circuit breaking with Airflow, including what it is, how you do it, and why you do it versus testing your data, and maybe some key challenges you might face. Next, we'll discuss how to implement circuit breakers with Airflow so you can do it yourself and hopefully improve your company's data quality in the process. But before we get started, let me do some really quick introductions. So as I said, I'm Pratik. I'm a founding engineer and technical lead here at Monte Carlo, where I help drive technical strategy for our data observability platform. Previously, I served as a technical lead at Barracuda, where I worked on email fraud prevention technologies. I graduated summa cum laude with a BS in computer science and engineering from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And as you can see from this slide, in my free time, I enjoy watching Broadway shows, flying airplanes, reading, and exploring new places. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, Monte Carlo is a Series D data reliability startup that basically coined the term and category of data observability. We observe an end-to-end -end solution that integrates with your favorite data stack tools like Airflow to improve data quality at each stage of the data lifecycle. And I've had the, we've had the amazing opportunity to work with lots of different amazing customers, such as JetBlue, Fox, CNN, Vimeo, and to try to help them achieve more reliable data pipelines through proactive monitoring, alerting, lineage, and now circuit breakers, courtesy of the star of the hour, Airflow. Okay, enough of that. Back to what you actually signed up for, how to eliminate data downtime with Airflow. Before we dive in, before we dive into the how to fix this problem and ensure it doesn't happen again, it helps to understand the implications of bad data for stakeholders all across the company. You can say it's like the gift that keeps on giving, so to speak, as you move downstream. Broken pipelines can manifest in any number of ways, originating in buggy code, missing data, or even operational issues. And there's literally no way to catch them all. So the key then is to combine a bunch of different techniques, like monitoring, alerting, testing, and yes, even circuit breaking, to prevent data quality issues as soon as they happen. And before they affect your stakeholders, whether those are internal analysts or external customers, Bad data can have some serious ramifications, be it lost revenue, erosion of trust, or even wasted resources, and that list goes on. Um, it affects all different types of organizations. Like for example, NASA, they had their Mars Climate Orbiter, and they lost this multi-million dollar satellite when the software used to build, build the technology used a different measurement than the astronauts used to program where the satellite should land. I think it was pound seconds instead of metric units. They lost 125 million and of course the years and years of progress. Another example is there was a 617 billion, yes, that's B with a billion fat finger incident on the Japanese stock market. It was a trading error. There was a broker who entered a wrong number and it caused a temporary stock fluctuation that sent the Japanese stock market to rattle for hours. Um, it was just a simple order of Toyota Motor stock, but it was worth more than the size of Sweden's entire economy. And the list of such incidents, of course, goes on. So while you may not necessarily risk listing $617 billion due to bad data quality, the implications only grow as data flows downstream. More commonly, however, bad data can result in some pretty serious issues for not just your team and relevant stakeholders, like maybe analysts and data scientists, but your company as a whole. Now, some metrics, as you can see from this slide, based on data collected from our own product, which services hundreds of leading data teams across industries and sizes on average, the average company will have 70 high severity data quality events each year for every thousand tables. 
And 30 to 50% of a data engineer's time is spent solving data quality issues. And that's from the New York Times, which says a lot. Um, and finally, 15 million is the average annual cost for companies resulting from data quality issues. And this can be stuff like inaccurate forecasts or data power products performing poorly. Say that five times fast. Okay, so what's going on here? As I'm sure you've experienced, there's a real lack of holistic or end-to-end -end visibility for your entire data pipeline, from your data sources to the warehouse and lake to the various orchestrators like Airflow you use. Luckily though, the good news here is data downtime looks the same across companies. Bad data is bad data. And at Monte Carlo, we've spoken to hundreds of data companies over the years across various different industries, all sizes, and by large, like I said, bad data looks the same to all of them, data as data. And as you can see from this slide, there's some questions that you've probably asked yourself about bad data too, like, is this up to date? Um, does this look wrong? Is this high? Is this low? Is this, why is this null? Why is this negative? Why is this zero? Is this a duplicate? What happens if I change something? There's so many permutations of these questions that I'm sure you've all asked yourselves. And this list just goes on and on. So the problem of data downtime and stopping bad data in its tracks can really be tackled by relying on some of the best practices of our software engineering friends. Software engineers leverage principles of site reliability and observability to ensure their applications are performing as expected. And that uptime is high while downtime is low. As organizations grow, the underlying tech staffs powering them become more complicated. For instance, maybe moving from a monolith to a microservice architecture. So it's really important for DevOps teams to maintain a constant pulse on the health of their systems. More specifically, observability speaks to this need and refers to the monitoring, tracking, and triaging of incidents to prevent downtime. As a result of this industry-wide shift to distributed systems, observability engineering has emerged as a fast-growing engineering discipline. But at its core, observability engineering can really be broken down into three major pillars. You have metrics, traces, and locks. Now, what are these three pillars? Metrics refers to a numeric representation of data measured over time. Traces refer casually related events in a distributed environment. And logs, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, spend time digging through them, are just a record of an event that took place at a given time and provide valuable context regarding when a specific event occurred. Okay, so that's on the engineering side. What is the solution for data? Well, on the data side, I've noticed, and perhaps you have as well, or at least empathize with this, is that our approaches to data reliability and generally data engineering are about eh, 10 years behind software engineering. In application development, every team has an observability solution. You can have New Relic, you have Datadog, you have PagerDuty, and you utilize all these things to measure the health of your applications and ensure reliability. But for some reason, data teams are completely flying blind still. Um, but luckily, the solution for data pipelines is kind of the same. You can kind of uh, have a, what we call a data reliability lifecycle. It's made of three components, to detect, to resolve, and prevent. These different phases uh, can be used in conjunction. So what's the first phase? Detect. After you've tested your data and ingested it into, produ into production, it's paramount that you monitor and alert for anomalies in your pipeline. In other words, detect when data issues occur. Data anomaly detection is a significant, albeit uh, reactive part of the strategy. And you can have automated monitoring and alerting for freshness, volume, distribution-based issues, and you can use them to keep tabs on your data reliability, SLIs and SLAs. And when, and when you don't meet them, you should be the first to know. Uh, and as data pipelines become increasingly complex, I think it's almost guaranteed for data it's going, you're, it's bound to break at one point or another. And being able to reduce that time to detection is really crucial for a data-driven business. Okay, so what about the next phase? Next phase of the data reliability lifecycle is resolving. Resolving really entails you access, you, you assess the impact of your broken data on your larger data ecosystem and corresponding data products, as well as communicate the issue downstream to those who need to know. 
Ideally, the entire impact analysis process would be centralized with corresponding alerts grouped and tagged appropriately. In this part of the life cycle, end-to-end -end lineage and statistical analysis can, analysis can be used to understand the root cause of the problem at hand. As teams become adept in understanding, triaging, and responding to incidents, they can reduce the time to resolution for common expected data incidents. Okay, cool. So what's the next phase? The next phase of this uh, data reliability life cycle is prevention. Uh, and basically, you process your prior learnings and historical information about your data pipelines and translate them into actionable preventative steps. For Take this for instance. Not every, every schema change an engineer makes to an existing data set doesn't mean that your pipelines are on fire. In fact, you can say schema changes or schema updates often signify development and progress. But without that proper context, like the detect phase of your data reliability lifecycle, uh, you're not able to pick up on these like subtle cues. But by applying this reliability lifecycle, teams should be able to surface logs, metadata, and queries about your data to gauge and even predict data health. And as you get more advanced and sophisticated, lifecycle should also be able to automatically adjust and update tests and monitors to match like the evolving business logic, and in turn, use that to reduce data downtime. So what does this really do? This framework allows data teams to be the first to know about data quality issues in productions, fully understand the impact of the issue, fully understand where data broke, take action to fix the issue, and collect learnings. Uh, so collect learnings over time so you can prevent the issue from happening ever again. And just like how you had those three pillars of observability for software reliability, every data team has pillars of observability for data reliability. And I've broken these down into five major areas that I think or we think are a good uh, or indicators of whether or not something is broken or gone wrong. And these consist of freshness, distribution, volume, schema, and lineage. All right. So let me break this down a little bit. The first of our pillars is freshness. Freshness seeks to understand how up-to-date your data tables are, as well as the kind of the cadence at which the tables are updated. Freshness is particularly important when it comes to decision-making, as I think we all know that stale data is basically synonymous with wasted time and money. Like, for example, if you take a look on the slide where you see this table called monitor issues and suggestions, you can see it's updated fairly, the pa update pattern is fairly standard. Um, but there's this small gap that happens. Maybe the DAG failed to run, or maybe it ran, but there was no actual update. Freshness uh, helps measure this, and you should be you should and you should know about changes or deviations from the norm. So your pipelines and your tables, and freshness is a great indicator of that. Okay, so next up we have is distribution. Distribution or a function of your data's possible values tells you if your data is within an accepted range. Data distribution gives you kind of insight into whether or not your tables can be trusted based on what is actually expected from your data. So again, if you look at this slide, you can see this table called key table scores. It has, it's tracking table types and the new one is added, snowflake stream in all caps. Let's say normally these values are all lowercase. So an uppercase is a deviation from that. And maybe your downstream processes don't know how to handle this. Obviously, this is a very simple one to, to solve, but you can imagine the different permutations of this problem, right? It's just, it's just something that's uh, not expected, right? Okay, so, so our next pillar here is volume. And volume really refers to the completeness of your data. Uh, table and kind of offers insights on the health of your data sources. So if 2 million rows suddenly turns into 5 million, you should know. And like you can see here on the slide, we have a table called query logs, and there was an unexpected deletion of 269 million rows. And as you can see from the update pattern, deletions are incredibly rare. So this is something your data team should know about and investigate and triage. Uh, understandably, right? Okay, so fourth. Fourth is schema. Schema is really changes in the organization of your data. In other words, schema can indicate broken data. Monitoring who makes changes to the table and when is kind of foundational to understanding the health of the data ecosystem. Not to mention preventing issues from occurring again. 
As you can see on the slide, fairly standard changes in your schema. Some new columns were added, some columns were modified. It kind of just speaks to the governance and how them what's going on. And even if it isn't necessarily an incident, like it's expected, or or it's kind of important to still stay in the know and kind of be aware of this because it gives you a good picture of how your data is changing. It gives you, it kind of touches you that discovery aspect of it. And finally, we have lineage. Uh, so lineage, uh, when data breaks, the first question is always where. So data lineage provides this answer by telling you which upstream sources and downstream instigators were impacted, as well as which teams are generating the data and who's accessing it. Essentially, good lineage is context. It collects information about metadata, speaks to governance, business, and technical guidelines associated with specific data tables. It's kind of lineage. You can, you can think of lineage as a single source of truth for all your data consumers. As you can see here on the screen, we have our upstream and downstream dependencies for this table from both a table perspective and the actual fields being modified. Okay. Okay, so tracking all these pillars can give you a good sense of how healthy your data is. And from there, whether or not data downtime incidents occur. This conceptual stuff is great and all, but how do we actually apply this? So the primary way I think data team data teams solve for data downtime is these three components. And the first one I wanna talk about is testing. So one of the most common ways to discover data quality issues is before they even enter your production data pipeline, just by testing your data. With testing, data engineers can validate their organization's assumptions about data and write logic to prevent the issue from working its way downstream. I think data is still a must have to help catch specific known problems, the keyword here is known, that surface in your data pipeline and can warn you when data or code breaks these original assumptions. And some there's so many different uh, data quality checks you can do, but some examples of this are like null values. Are there any unknown values or null where they shouldn't be? Um, did the uniqueness change? Like, are there duplicate values and unique ID fields? Are known invariants um, broken? Like, for example, is profit always the difference between revenue and cost? And, and the list, again, goes on and on. So data testing is just really very similar to how software engineers use testing to alert them on well-understood issues that they anticipate to happen in their, to happen to their applications. But I don't think it's enough on its own, at least. It's not enough to stay on top of these broken data pipelines, but luckily here is where monitoring and uh, lineage really help. Because even with the most comprehensive testing suites, you can't account for any and every issue that might arise across your stack, not just the sections covered by specific tests. So to account for both the unknowns and the unknown unknowns that keep up with the ever-growing amount of known <laughs> unknowns, and your data pipeline, you need to observe, you need to invest in observability too. Modern data environments are highly complex. And for most data teams, creating and maintaining high coverage testing is not really possible, or maybe it's not even desirable in many instances. And due to the sheer complexity of data, it's improbable that data engineers can anticipate all eventualities during development. Where testing falls short, data monitoring and lineage fill the gap providing any additional layer of visibility into your entire data stack. Data monitoring is essentially keeping a constant pulse on your data changes over time and watching out for anomalies or other issues. And of course, now data lineage is an evolving real-time map of data at each stage in the pipeline and takes monitoring and anomaly detections, data quality problem solving levels problem solving abilities to the next level. By giving you the tools necessary to troubleshoot issues before they become data disasters downstream. And of course, if monitoring and lineage are packaged together, that's even better. So a little bit more about data lineage. It's kind of a type of metadata you can think of that traces relationships between upstream and downstream dependencies in your data pipelines. Lineage is all about mapping. That's kind of what is at its core. It's where your data comes from, how it changes as it moves throughout your pipelines, and where it's really surfaced your end consumers. And as I think your data track grows more complex, mapping lineage becomes more challenging. But when done right, 
data lineage is incredibly useful. Lineage helps data teams do a bunch of different things, like understand how specific as changes to specific assets will impact downstream dependencies, so you don't have to work blindly and risk unwelcome surprises for your unknown stakeholders. It also lets you troubleshoot the root cause of data issues faster when they do occur by making it easy to see at a glance what upstream errors may have caused reports to break. And it also allows you to communicate the impact of broken data to consumers who rely on downstream reports and tables proactively keep, and you can proactively keep them in the loop when data may be inaccurate and notify them when issues have been resolved. The transparency here is paramount. It's very important to always be open and transparent about issues and communicate them through. Okay, so now circuit breaking. Which, which, which is really just testing on steroids, because it, as it stops data pipelines when data doesn't meet a set of quality or integrity thresholds. This can be useful for multiple purposes, and including, and of course, here definitely not limited to, checking if data doesn't meet your requirements between transformation steps, or maybe after an ETL or ELT job executes, but before your BI dashboards are updated, it's, it, can, it, can, it fits almost anywhere. But it's really the most critical subset of your test, essentially. And of course, it should be coupled with monitoring and lineage. It's kind of the preventive or proactive component versus the more reactive there. Uh, this is comparing to monitoring and inline versus pre-production for, for testing. But don't worry if it's still kind of a little bit of a nebulous term right now. I'll be spending most of the rest of the presentation actually diving into what it means to circuit break. Okay. I did promise I'm going to talk about circuit breaking nests, but this is a very important and quick aside. Since I've gone on and on about monitoring, I do want to mention some of the challenges. As you know, there are multiple ways to see what's going on with Airflow. You have like the DAG view, you have the uh, tree view, you have the code view, you have logging, and you have built-in task lineage even. But as you scale, these can get overwhelming and confusing to maintain and follow. And most importantly, they don't have any context. Um, so what, what does that mean though? What do I mean by no context? What I mean here is that Airflow pipelines are not data aware. They know how to run tasks and they do an amazing job of that, but they have no idea what's going on in those tasks. You can be calling an API, you can be running a query, you can be doing whatever, uh, but Airflow doesn't know, right? Um, so you kind of have to dig. And the execution metadata that's provided is not really sufficient, which of course Airflow has in spades. Uh, like, like in this example, your task could be green, but nothing actually updated in the underlying table. This is a very bogus query, right? As you see on screen, it's like an insert into where you know, a condition is always going to be false, but you could have accidentally transformed your query into something like this, right? And no, no rows are inserted, but from Airflow's perspective, the task is green and the DAG should continue. Right, um, and they could. There are so many permutations of this. Your your job could introduce nulls or drop all records and rows. Uh, but again, from Airflow, they're just marked as success. Um, so this is why I kind of like that data lineage and context is so important. And you got to do it through some sort of data observability platform. And Airflow actually has made some great strides here through uh, uh, tools like Apache Atlas. I actually think there's another talk about it during this summit, which I would recommend if you haven't already. Okay, okay, let's let's get back to it though. So great, monitoring is the primary tool and testing is something we can leverage too. But as promised, what exactly is a circuit breaker? Well, from the word, world of circuits, um, no surprises there. <laughs> As a circuit, a circuit breaker is a safety device that's designed, in short, to protect an electric current from damage, either caused by an overcurrent or a short. What it does is it basically interrupts or breaks the flow to prevent worse issues like a fire. It's kind of of the belief or thought process that you'd rather have a blackout or an outage than your entire house burning down. I think you can reasonably agree with that sentiment. Um, circuit breakers in the data world are the same. Um, so you, the, the, the philosophy is you rather not have your pipeline continue than a bad dashboard and your CEO getting uh, bad information and then being upset, which can also be a fire of a different type. 
Um, but before we continue on, though, another very important principle is that a circuit breaker needs to be resettable, either automatically or manually, to allow the pipeline to continue when an issue is resolved or when you deem it to be in an acceptable condition. So basically, what we're doing is detecting something is wrong, taking temporary steps from preventing the issue from propagating downstream. And if you're familiar with a circuit breaker design pattern kind of used in software development, it's, it's pretty similar where there's an open and a closed state. When closed, your pipeline is acting normally and data is flowing, but when open, the pipeline is stopped for either manual or automated intervention. If you are familiar with this design pattern, you'll know there's also a half open state. But I feel like that one doesn't really fit in the data science and analytics world where you wouldn't want to necessarily let partial bad data through the test, or at least I don't, I wouldn't do that. But like all things, this is nuanced and it kind of really depends on the exact business case you're looking at. So maybe you find a scenario where it does make sense. Okay. So we talked about that, but that still sounds an awful lot like testing. What exactly is the difference? Um, so circuit breakers should really be the most critical of your tests. From the underlying query or operation, they might be very similar, but it should be really the, only the subset that absolutely prevents your pipeline from running. For example, if you have a model with, where no null columns are okay, that might be an ideal circuit breaker. But if a few are acceptable or if every now and then it's okay or some permutation of that, that's probably a poor circuit breaker and maybe a better test because it would just generate a lot of unactionable noise, which also has the really, really fun benefit of introducing downtime. Um, so for the same reason, it's, it's basically like a guarantee, right? So for this reason, circuit breakers should be used sparingly. Go crazy with the number of tests you have but only really circuit break on the assumptions that are that absolutely can't be broken for your data to be considered valid. And I know some of you are saying here, every test I have is critical and important, but it's also important to be pragmatic because if everything is important, nothing is. I know it's cliche, but it is true here. Um, also, since circuit breakers are embedded in your pipeline, it's very important that they're fully automated. There's no manual verification or review, like some of the tests you might run. You're not comparing results in the console or looking at a spreadsheet or a table. It's happening in your pipeline completely automatically. And part and because of this, if a circuit is ever open, teams should be paged immediately to resolve. This is so maybe your batch can be backfilled and any because any open circuit causes downtime. And unlike your normal tests, which might you might run while developing or on an off schedule, circuit breakers impact your SLA. So, and lastly, while your tests ideally can be in dev or stage, circuit breakers are always in production. Though you can, and we recommend, if you, you should replicate them to your dev and save environments too, but the actual circuit breaker is in production. Uh, and like with code, um, testing is usually just a point in time snapshot. But remember, your data changes and your circuit breaker will always be running against this, challenge, this changing data. Okay, cool. So what about some challenges with circuit breakers? I think like everything, there are always challenges. Unlike monitoring and even testing, circuit, you have to remember circuit breakers are proactive, not reactive. So, so while they do provide like an excellent way to prevent data issues from occurring in the first place, they can also wreak havoc on your pipeline where delayed jobs set off like chain reactions of data failures downstreams. So if you pick a bad circuit breaker, you might actually end up introducing more downtime than you're trying to prevent. So to kind of deal with this, I've outlined a few best practices that we've found from our experience of helping customers implement circuit breakers. Okay, of these, first, try to pick a rule where you have a good understanding of the history and what type of incidents or threshold breaches are triggered. It doesn't really matter if it's a relative, absolute, automatic, using some fancy ML models. If you don't understand it well, generally, it's not a good candidate for a circuit breaker. And don't go crazy adding circuit breakers to, your, to, to every DAG. Start small, or you'll overwhelm yourself with noise and breakages. Pick your one or two maybe less important pipelines where you have good monitoring set up, and slowly start adding rules. 
once you're more comfortable with it, then start, you know, propagating it down to your more critical pipelines. Um, and make sure the rules, be it queries or some sort of custom logic, have reasonable timeouts. If your batch job takes one hour to complete, it's probably not reasonable for your circuit breaker to take another hour as you've just doubled the SLA of your pipeline. And part of that is to consider cost too. Um, and, and lastly, I, I want to mention is you should understand when to fail open. If there's an outage or issue with running a test, how important is this circuit breaker really? If it 100% can't be skipped, don't fail open. But otherwise, consider doing so. And even though I said, uh, if you, remember, like I said, if you think everything is essential and critical, nothing is. Even though circuit breakers should be the most important of your tests, there should still be a hierarchy of the of importance within circuit breakers themselves. Okay, cool. So now let's actually build a circuit breaker. So you can see here on, on, on this slide, we have a very, very simple deck where we have like an example ELT job one and we have example ELT job two. And in between them, we've introduced uh, we've introduced two circuit breakers using the short circuit operator. One is always false in this case and one is always true, though in reality, obviously yours will be false or true depending on the data. But in this case, we have we have this simple setup. So that means the ELT job two is, is skipped because the false circuit uh, tripped. And let me actually walk you through the code here. Again, the code is very simple, right? And But it, it just is to kind of illustrate the point of where to put circuit breakers in your pipeline. Um, you'd obviously replace the actual things, you, the actual circuit breakers with your own business logic. And like, if, if you walk through it, example, ELT job one won't actually be a bash operator that says I'm transforming an important table. It will actually be transforming an important table using some other operator. After that, you will put you will put one or more circuit breakers to to validate the assumptions that, that were made in the first uh, task are are met or are held, and then you run your your next part of your transformation. So, like in this case, you the the, the transform table is used to uh, build a very important dashboard. So you circuit break in between that. Very straightforward. So it's so it's very simple to in introduce them into your pipeline, and of course, if you're using Airflow two. Um, it's you can utilize the ta task flow API paradigm. It's just a nice, convenient way of kind of uh, building these tags. And I'm showing an example here in Python that kind of does the whole you know extract, transform, load pattern. Um, but obviously, in reality, you wouldn't use Python and XCOMs to push data around. You, you'd most likely be updating models and tables, like writing to Snowflake or BigQuery or Redshift, or maybe updating blob storages like S3. Um, I mean, you could you could technically do this in Python, but it's most scalable. Mostly, when you get to scale, you, you're not putting things in memory. But let's in this case assume that we are. So we have this extract step that does some very simple stuff. It just grabs some items from our fake database of in, in dollars. Very simple. Just, they're extracted and they're they're sent over. So now we're transforming them. So we have this uh, variable called USD to Euro conversion rate. And as you can see here, it's negative. In reality, this would most likely be an API or some sort of service that you call that gets you the most recent conversion values, right? Um, or a table. Right, that, that that contains these, though you know it has to be updated. Uh, regardless, it could be some third party entity or or service that's uh, unreliable or has an issue, and it could actually return to you a negative negative conversion rate. And as you know, you can't have a negative conversion rate; it's just not possible. Um, so this is something you'd want to check for. So. You, if, if we didn't do this check, we would have just, you know, continued to do our transformation and done the conversion from, you know, dollars to euros and loaded it in. In this case, the, our load step is just printing, but you can imagine the load like writing to a table, writing to S3, writing to whatever, right? This would just happen and we would have never known about it and uh, we would have bad data um, in this model and anything downstream of that would have also had completely inaccurate values. So what all we did is a very simple check. We just iterate through the items and check to see if any of them is negative and we trip the circuit if, if this condition is ever met. And it's a very simply done through this short circuit operator. Again, and it's, it's completely all in Python, but again, you can use whatever you need. Um, 
So this just just to illustrate the point of how a circuit breaker could have could have solved this data or could have prevented this data quality issue from happening in the first place. And you can use any type of test or threshold. Like in this case, we might have we might want to introduce a few more that assumptions that we know will always be true. Like for example, after conversion, it should never be null. It should never be zero, right? Um, whatever type of things that you know about your data are good candidates to introduce here and be a circuit breakers. Um, so now though, you'll eventually start having lots of circuit breakers in your pipeline. So if you're again, using Airflow 2, task groups are great here because they kind of improve manageability. It's kind of visual, but instead of having like, as you can see on the right, 10 different circuits, which are very hard to see and like you have to rotate through them and have to parse through them, task groups, you can just boom, convert it. And it's just a single circuit visually. And it's just a really convenient way to, to like, just get a bird's eye view of what's going on with your DAG. So I do have some suggestions when you do add circuit breakers to your pipeline. The first of them here is don't limit yourself to one type of operator. I showed examples of the short circuit operator, but there's no particular reason that you have or limit it to this or have to use it. It's convenient because it does a lot of stuff built in and it like skips the subsequent steps, but you can use anything. You can use the Python operator, you can use the Basher operator, you can use whatever custom logic you want. And this also means you can do things like leveraging different tools. Like for example, you can leverage DBT, grid expectations, or of course, even Monte Carlo as a circuit breaker. Now, for those of you who are, for example, familiar with DBT, they'd like that those are tests, but there's no reason you can't use those tests as circuit breakers too, right? You just have to put them in your pipeline and raise or breach when, they're, when, when the condition is false, right? Anyway, but if you are introducing your own custom logic, I highly recommend using the airflow skip exception instead of raising an airflow exception when, when something is in breach. And it's kind of two purposes around this. The first one is uh, it kind of prevents automatic retries, which I think makes sense because if, you're, if, you're, if your circuit is in breach, you probably don't want to retry it as because retrying it will just produce the same results. And if it doesn't produce the same results, it might not have been a good choice as a circuit or something changed in your data in between. And that's something you want to investigate anyway. The other bit, it creates a little bit more visibility. And that's really very important when you're investigating issues. It marks things as skipped instead of as failed. And like that visual difference is, is very helpful when trying to navigate. Um, similarly, for that same reason, I recommend you shouldn't merge multiple circuits into one operator. When you first like instrument a bunch of circuit breakers, it does, you're inclined to do so. It feels like a very convenient way. Oh, I can just put like 10 different uh, checks all in this one, one circuit and it's easy and I'm done. And it's just, you know, very simple. I don't have a bunch of, uh, don't have a bunch of tasks in my DAG anymore. But again, what it really does though, as you scale, is it kind of makes it harder to trace because you don't obviously know what threshold tripped the circuit. You don't know if it was your null test or your or your zero test or your or whatever test till you actually dive in and dig through the logs and look through it. And when you're investing in an incident where time is of the time is key and you want to move quickly and you have to evaluate and you're under pressure, you want to provide yourself as much information as quickly as possible. You want to make your lives easier. So by making it very visually obvious what the issue is, you're making both your life and your colleagues' lives a lot easier. Similarly, you probably might be inclined to kind of merge the circuit breaker into the operator. I'll put the thing at the end of the, of the transformation inside the same operator because I already have like all this stuff here. It's just really easy to do. But I also recommend avoiding that because it's the same thing. It kind of uh, reduces your visibility into what's going on. Because uh, it makes it hard to find out if the job failed or the circuit was tripped, and without adding like a bunch of logic, you might you might like your job might task get retried, and then it would retry both the job and the circuit, and like it's just it's just hard to see why it failed. You you, you won't be able to see the exact trace without di diving into the logs, and sometimes you need that visual cue. And Another suggestion I have is it's very important to include a mechanism to bypass or skip a circuit breaker. If you remember, this is what differs a circuit breaker from a fuse. It needs to be skippable uh, when you're when it's kind of in an accept when it's in an acceptable state. So you would probably want to have some sort of like environment thing or a variable or something like that to make sure you can quickly um, you can quickly let the circuit flow. And of course, 
when you find you have repeating patterns, you have common things that you're doing a lot, put them into plugins, custom operators. You want to, you don't want to copy paste. You want to make things maintainable. You want to make things reusable. You want to be modular and follow these like design patterns that are there for your benefit. So when you find these patterns, make them into custom operators and you know, make them available for both you and the rest of your team so you can work more efficiently, work faster, and you know, have a better time with it. Okay, cool. So now let's talk about a few practical thresholds. So if you remember, one of the pillars that I talked about was freshness. Using freshness is a great, uh, great um, threshold to use in circuit breaking. And it's a pretty common pattern because you can actually check to see if your table was updated. And luckily, a lot of uh, a lot of resources like different warehouses like Snowflake and BigQuery and lakes like uh, Databricks with their well their Delta Lake make this pretty easy to find out. It's either in some sort of meta store or some sort of log. And like for example, with Snowflake, you just check the last altered field and information schema tables for for this database or. With Delta Lake, you just run describe details or take a look at the snapshot in Delta Log, and you basically get information of whether it's updated, and you can you can breach on that. Um, it is important to remember though that this alone isn't sufficient usually because you could have a table that's marked for an insert but no insert actually happened. So it's important to combine this with other things like volume, like the, the volume change. And also over time, because these patterns are very useful, because spot and time things are are hard to use and you can't you can't generalize about them. But if you have trends, you can use that to like make better determinations and better circuit breakers. Okay. And of course you can just use any custom logic and circuit breakers. And a really easy way to do that is just breach when the row count is greater than zero. Very simple test. You have, I have three examples of SQL here, but you can kind of do anything. Like for example, you can check to see if your value is within five acceptable labels. You can do like that null test. You can do that zero test. You can do, uh, you can do things across tables. You can check other assets and other resources and compare them. Like for example, the third one here, you can check the, you know, referential integrity between tables. You can check two tables are identical record for record. Like if you have a stage and you have a production, you want to see that they match maybe, or, or you want to check that two tables have the same number of rows after some complex like operation. You can kind of do whatever fits your business case and whatever really fits your, like whatever your imagination comes up with as something you think that's very important to be, to always be the case. So this is, this one's really up to you guys or all of you folks. Um, okay. So what happens after a circuit breaker is triggered? So unfortunately, the answer here is every data incident is different and it's nuanced and it's complicated. But I think the following seven steps are kind of a good run book or at least a good starting point. Um, so the first thing I would do is I would review any table and field the niche, which is why it's so important to have this context for all your impacted downstream assets and notify stakeholders. This one's very important because like I said, you have to be transparent about issues. You can't hide them. You have to be, you have to, you have to be very upfront and honest if something happens. And notifying stakeholders is, is the first step in that. You have to let know there's this data issue. We're investigating it and we'll solve it. It's, it's all about attitude. As long as you're willing to solve it, that's that's what you need. So then you would then after you do that, it's very, I think it's important to review logs and documentation about the circuit that trips. Hopefully you have some documentation on it. Similarly, you want to do review any logs and documentation for the actual tasks that you were being evaluated, see if they do anything meaningful and hopefully it's more than just calling some API. Otherwise, you know, you dump you jump down the levels. But luckily for that, you have field lineage and and, uh, and just regular table lineage. And you can actually find out what are all these upstream transformations. And one of them might have been the root cause. So you evaluate and kind of build this like holistic picture. You also, as part of this, you should check any cha recent changes to your pipeline. That can be changes that are done like a query has been modified or maybe the data source has changed or there's a new stream or a new customer. There's like some, all of these things are very important to check because they could be the root cause. Right, And as you're doing this, it's important to sample the table itself for these anomalies. And if you can, use any tools that review historical versions of the table. Like, like for example, Snowflake has time travel, or let's say you are um, have historical versions of the table, check them to see what changed. 
And speaking of history, it's important to also review historical incidents. Maybe they can tell you what patterns. It could be historical incidents for the table itself, or it could be historical incidents for stuff upstream. Maybe there's a common pattern or trend of something that frequently happened. Like maybe something changed and it raised an alert or issue upstream, and now it only finally made it downstream to this job. Right. And as part of that, it's also checking schema change, right? Like check to see if the structure of assets have, has been modified. So hopefully these seven steps are like will help you triage and kind of solve your data issues. Okay. So now here, I'm going to get a little bit shameless. So feel free to tune out and come back in eh, like two minutes if you don't want a quick pitch. I, I totally don't blame you here. I do, I do want to mention that we do have an SDK and Airflow provider that can be used to automate and simplify and customize circuit breaking in your Airflow DAGs or any other orchestrators. And I also did want to take a small opportunity to talk a little bit more about MC in general. MC or Monte Carlo. Um, so most teams uh, will find that it helps to have kind of one platform to manage it all, as it were to manage circuit breaking, testing, monitoring, lineage, all in one place. And like we kind of refer to this spectrum as data observability. So what data observability really does is it automatically detects data incidents for you. And it equips your teams with fully automated lineage context and workflow tools you need to triage and find root cause and resolve and track incidents. It also gives you on-demand insights to help your team avoid data incidents altogether as you make field, table, and schema changes, and even migrations. And it does this all kind of by running ML monitors across your entire data stack using all of the pillars we talked about. Like it, it uses freshness, it uses volume, it uses schema distribution. And if, for instance, with Monte Carlo, we do this very simply by deploying a collector either in our own environment or in your VPC to collect and analyze metadata. And this is all requires very limited and inexpensive compute on your side. And of course, beyond this automated detection and target alerting, we also believe data observability must deliver workflows and tools to actually resolve these data incidents and resolve it quickly. So to enable this, we help teams quickly identify upstream sources and understand downstream dependencies with fully automated and man maintained field level lineage, which is available for your team within 24 hours of your setup. So with field level lineage, this enables us to surface the context your team needs to resolve issues quickly. You can see the impact radius to see which tables and dashboards and end users for impact to immediately triage incidents. And we also built integrations to the tools like DBT and Airflow. So you can also have your diagnostic information on how to resolve issues. This and all the other contextual data and insights your team needs to resolve incidents quickly are all kind of in one place. And finally, your team can also manage workflows with data observability, including incident status, updates, owners, and severity levels. So you can work across teams and inform end users when incidents are actively being investigated and when they're finally resolved. Again, transparency is key. Okay, cool. I am done plugging. Hopefully you can you guys can hop, you can, all, all of you folks can hop in now. And I wanted to cover a quick a couple of quick key takeaways. Uh, and hopefully they'll help you embark on your own data quality and anomaly detection journey with Airflow. So the first of these is data downtime, as we demonstrated, hopefully, has a measurable impact on your on both you and your business. It, and you can kind of use these five pillars that were defined to give you like an overview or a holistic picture of your data environment, your end-to-end -end data environment. And luckily for us, one of these is one of these uh, tools we can leverage is circuit breaking, and it's very powerful. And as you've seen, like with the custom SQL or the simple Python snippets, it's pretty easy to implement. But it's really important to remember it's just one tool, so it's really needs to be combined with other things like monitoring, alerting, lineage, and even testing for maximal effectiveness. Like, like any tool, you can't use it to solve every problem. You have to combine it with other things and use it where it makes sense to do so. And of course, speaking of testing, circuit breakers are, of course, testing on steroids. So you also have to be careful when you instrument them and use, utilize them to prevent um, unintended data downtime. You don't want to you don't want to cause more problems than you're actually trying to solve. So you need to pick good circuit breakers. And luckily, though, you have lots of different options on how to actually end up instrumenting uh, circuit breakers. 
and what thresholds you use and what permutations you use, what operators you use, what languages you use. You have, you have different things. You can use different APIs. You can use different third-party tools, different plugins. You, can, you have so many options. So this is really a great opportunity to kind of experiment and have fun. And that's kind of what really this is all about, right? You have to have fun with what you're building and you have to enjoy what you're doing. And that's all. That's all I have. So thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm Pratik. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.